We got a Grammy winner, a brand new ITL, a bunch of stuff. Welcome to the place, Pensado's Place. Mm. Hey guys, glad to have you back. We've got a great show for you. We've got a lot of, a lot of information packed into um, to today's five-hour show. What, what's up, Herm? You're, I've got hour one. You've got the last four? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Right, I'm, I'm going to go on and get on with mine. You, you can get your notes for the next four. Um, all good stuff. It was a good week. Went fast. Man, yeah. He has a couple good, we, we had a couple good, good guys we met. Yeah, you know, Andrew so. and Rico from... Uh, from Dallas, and oh, Robert, oh, right, and uh, right, right. Joe from Chicago. Yeah, Man, I, we had a we had, we had a great time. Good guys, good guys. Um, we got a lot of information, so let's get to it. Um, hello, Vintage King, as usual. Say hello to our buddies. Hi there, VK. What's up? You see in the chat room is our man Drew Townsend. You know Drew by now. His his uh, screen is up on there. You have your stump the Vintage King guy yeah. question. Yeah, ask him. Ask him. If it's really worth it to use silver solder as opposed to lead solder, and how much better does it sound in an actual percentage term? Wow. All right, Drew. Drew Townsend, you are on, and the chat room will be addressing that, and you can handle it. Um, as usual, we want you guys to, uh, well, you know our homework stuff, our Facebook, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. You'll see that screen pop up, and you know where to go there. There it is. So make sure you contact us. And also, you want to go to pensadosplace.tv for all the information on stuff. We're going to be loading that stuff up, that website, our website, with much more information and stuff that's going on, because lots of stuff is going on. Mm -hmm. um, past that, I think... Uh, I think we should get to it. it uh, you know, our corner office is, our man is here. He wasn't here last week. Drew. And our corner office kind of revolted. That was really nice of you to post bail. I mean, that was <laughs> above and beyond the call. No, no, dude. man. It's love, man. It's family. <laughs> it's family. It's, no, no, no. It's cool. It's cool. But he looks cute in that ankle bracelet, don't you think? Well, listen, he, he led Occupy Palmdale. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I'm proud of what you did. <laughs> Man, I Man, was, I was so proud of you. You know, we, we will always we'll we find missed, the money for that. We missed the Drewster, you know? And, and we the missed room, the whatever that is. We missed it, you the know? The corner office is not happy last week, so, uh, so he's back. So we're going to yeah. spend some time there. Excellent. Enough of our ranting and, and, and raving and stuff like that. Why don't we, uh, let's get to ITL introduce and get it popping. Okay, guys, what I wanted to do is... Um, from time to time, you're going to find a need to take program drums and make them sound like live drums. Uh, there's multiple ways to do it. And in, in this week's ITL, I showed you a song that I was currently working on and kind of how to accomplish that. So you can apply this to many things as always. So um, let's show them what we got, uh, Will. Uh, ITL. Hey, guys. How you doing? Um, been a minute. Good to see you. Good to see you again. Um, today, um, this week I've been working with a gifted writer, artist, uh, Andrew Albert. Uh, he's from Nashville. And uh, as predicted, he's, uh, I don't want to use the word country because I'm not sure there is such a, a, a pure genre anymore as, as country. Um, country is, uh, it ain't your granddaddy's country anymore. And uh, Andrew gave me the, uh, the challenge of uh, you know, trying to uh, maintain links to the past, but also make sure it's modern. And, and he brought me something interesting. His engineer, uh, Rico Gonzalez, who's excellent, um, they're both from Dallas, by the way, um, used Superior Drummer, my buddy Pat Thrall's um, drum programming and, and sample system. It's pretty incredible. And uh, with the attempt to make it sound live, Rico's a drummer, so he, he kind of performed the parts, which is something you might not be able to do yourself. But I just want to show you that you can take programmed drums and, and make them fit in a world that's really, really got some of the best live drummers, as opposed to dead drummers, in the world. I mean, you know, I've said it before, I think the best musicians in the world are in Nashville, uh, best songwriters. So anyway, I want to show you kind of how I approached contributing to, to, to program drums and making them sound a little bit live. I, I think that might be applicable to um, everything from hip hop, certainly to rock, to pop. It, it might just be you want to do the, the verses kind of dry and the, the um, 
the course is kind of live, kind of like what uh, uh, I did for Rhett Lawrence along with another engineer, Steve McMillan, on uh, uh, Miss Independent, Kelly Clarkson. The verses are program and the, and the hooks are live. So let's get to it. Let me play you a, a before. Now this before already has a little bit of ambience built into it because uh, the engineer Rico constructed a, a couple of ambient tracks. Now you can construct your own ambient track several, way, several ways. You can take, uh, what I recommend is find a room in your house that's got nice sound to it, you know, not too dark, not too uh, thuddy, and not too reverby. Put two speakers in the room, hook those up to a left and right, and then send your, your drums, two track, create a two track, send that out to those speakers, put two mics in front of the speakers, maybe the more, the farther away from the mic, from the speaker, the farther away from the speaker you place the mic, the more room ambience you're going to get. Start off with like maybe a foot and then record that and then I'll show you how to treat that and mix it back in and you'll, your, your drums are going to sound like John Bonham if you want them to. Okay, here's the track, the drum track as we've incorporate all these elements along with some EQ and compression. Okay, let's attack this. Let's attack a couple of elements individually and show you what we did. Okay, our ambient track that, that, that you can create with the speakers in the room, it should sound like this. And that would work for maybe, you know, a soft kind of sound, but, but we want a little edgier sound. So let's throw on the, uh, 1176. Okay. Now, mixed in with the song, this is what's screwing it up. Make sure this worked right. No, nope, see, it doesn't get my kicks. God doesn't get half the stuff. Oh, yeah, it does. Can okay, I mix in with the song? This is without it. With it. Can okay, I exaggerate it so you can hear it? Now, now let's check out the overheads because the, the symbols, the symbols kind of are very important to impart a, a sense of liveness. So with the symbols, you want to increase the attack with your EQ. Maybe add a little top end EQ. Uh, you might try to plug in like bittersweet to, or um, uh, one of those transient enhancers. I think. Uh, Oxford makes one, and SPL makes a great one. I'm not going to go into that. We did that already. But just increase the attack on the cymbal a little bit. Okay, so um, this is our overhead without anything. There again, you can create that with our speakers in the room. Now, on the Last track I showed you, I added a little bit of Brocasti uh, a and Chamber. I'm going to show you that on this. Okay, let's see what we got here. A little compression. A little SSL. Add the, the, the chamber. Exaggerate it. That, that contributes to the to the vibe. Now this is this one is very important. The snare, because of its because of its importance and its and its and its place in the mix, the snare is the downbeat. Without a downbeat, we ha we don't have rock, we don't have hip hop, we've got some kind of classical music. The snare is so vital, so important. Um, not as important as vocals, but pretty close. So we're gonna we're gonna Jack Joseph Pleegeyes the snare so it, so it gets longer. The, the, there's ambience in the sample because it's a real sample. Pat recorded them in a, um, I think it was in a studio in New York. He'll call and tell us. 
uh, or he's going to be on the show. And uh, so if you compress the snare, you get more of the real room it was recorded in. Let me show you this. This is neat. Okay, here's the snare. All right, not bad, huh? Okay, so let's let's put a little EQ on it. All right, now let's add a little reverb. Those are the reverbs that, that I got from Rico, and then these are the ones I added. These are the ones I added. This is the same A&M chamber. I love that. All right, now here's a little, oh man, I need herb. P.A. de resistance, what's the word? P P P Peace de resistance. Peace de resistance. I don't know. Make up your own damn French word. I don't know French. I know some French people. But anyway, this is, I think, this is, to me, this is the favorite thing I'm going to show you today. The favorite thing? Okay, let's add in our parallel compressed snare. Uh, uh, this is the EQ. This is the compression. Okay. I'm going to mute it so you can't hear it. You can see it. You can hear the compressor grabbing the the snare and lengthening. The, the type of cr uh, compressor you use is not that important. Try ratio of six. Start off with like a 15 to 20 millisecond attack time. Um, maybe as high as 25 if you want a little more transients to come through. I'm not interested in getting any transients from the from this. I, I just want reverb, and then and then adjust your release time so that it gives you the, the tempo you want turns out the, the the 160 this old 160 from UAD not old UAD plugin but the old 160 that's a new UAD plugin the attack and release are perfect for me so guys and summing up um, why go through all this trouble well there's some forms of music uh, that, that we wouldn't want to do this in it, it would just give kind of the wrong sound, you know, like some of the, some of the uh, hip hop stuff, some of the dance stuff. We try to keep that the opposite of what we're trying to do here. I'm giving you this as an option, like um, it's not something just for rock or country music. You can use it in hip hop. Um, you can use it anytime you want, but the problem we're trying to solve is to, is to give the listener the impression that he, that, that he or she is listening to a live drummer, a, a performed part. The, 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 the parts themselves can be played by a real drummer. They were, so there's not any things where you'd need to be a six-handed drummer to play something. And what we're trying to do is take the key components of, a, of, a, of an entire drum track that was programmed from samples, take the key components, and in this case we took three components and, made, and gave the entire track the impression that it was a live performance recorded in a, in a, in a studio or recorded live anywhere you want. So the three elements, let me review. We took the snare, we lengthened the ambience that was in the sample that Pat Thrall recorded that was part of the Superior Drummer. We lengthened that, the decay on that with compression. We took our overhead mics that we created with the speaker and mic technique I showed you. And um, we added a little ambience to that, a little compression to that to, to lengthen and get the, the, the amount of room noise, that we, room, room sound that we wanted and then we took a, a, an ambient mic, you might say, or a room mics, stereo room mics, and we we treated that so that it emphasized the 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 decay in that natural space. We wanted more, so com we were we're using compression in all three cases to get a longer decay sound or the natural reverb that that was on the 
samples to to lengthen them. I, I, I think I, I think I, I think I, I'm uh, I think I'm imparting this information to you in a way that you can digest it. But as always, experiment, experiment, experiment. If you're if you're a hip hop guy, maybe just try this on a bridge and then go back to a dry. Um, I mentioned earlier a song that Rhett Lawrence program the verses dry, the choruses live. There's all kinds of applications for this. Um, and you don't have to do it on just drums. You can do this on, the same technique on guitars, on pianos. You can take a eight bar section of your, of your track, print it as a two track, run it through this, these same techniques, over compress it and mic it from a live room and, 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 and get a little eight bar section that's really cool. So it, it, as always, these things can be applied any number of ways. Hope that hope that hope that gives you some ideas. Man, I was gonna try to do good today, and I screwed up right from the top. <laughs> That's funny. It's Herb's fault, guys. Man, we're really, really, really uh, in good shape today. We've got uh, Jason Schweitzer on today. Jason just won a Grammy for uh, Eminem's record last year. Nominated for the Kerry Hilson record. He's done uh, Wiz Khalifa, Snoop, Macy Gray. Um, Mayor Hawthorne, which we're going to talk to him about, uh, Dr. Dre, Pussycat Dolls, and Josh Groban. No, I met up to Josh Groban. He didn't do Josh Groban. I thought he did Josh Groban remix album. <laughs> welcome. Well, welcome, this, this Jason. Excited. Good to have you. Uh, I've been familiar with Jason's work for a long time. Uh, and he works in and out of Larrabee and uh, I've, I've, I've admired what he does, and there's a particular reason why I wanted him to be on the show today, because I think the career path that Jason took to get to where he is is something that all you guys could could benefit from, and even if you don't want to do this for a living, there's some things that he does that I think are going to really be interesting to you today, so uh, we're going to jump right into that, right, Herb? Absolutely. Okay, Jay, what's up, man? Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Everything's cool. Um, Jason started out, I don't know why I'm talking, I could just ask him a question of how he got started, or I could, just, I could just tell everybody what I know about right. it and see if he's right. Would, audience, let's try something new. The audience would love a question. Go. <laughs> Damn, I should have taken the second half of that Charlie Rose course. Um, so, man, tell us how you got started into, into this thing we call music, because I know you're, you're an ex-violin player, you're still a jazz sax player doing hip-hop. Yeah, you know... I've always loved music ever since I was a little kid. I was in kindergarten and I heard a sax on the radio. I asked my dad what it was and there was our band teacher in elementary, like when you went into music class, everyone had to go to music class and that's where I started playing violin first and Ooh. he played sax and he played it for me and I was like, I want to play that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's really where it started, it was like in first grade. I got my first sax and I just started playing music and I don't know what it is, something about music when I hear it. You know, I'm not one of those people that can put on a radio and have it as background mm -hmm. or fall asleep. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. Like, if I, the music is on, I'm listening to it, and I listen mm -hmm. to every part, the groove, the vibe. I've, I've always loved music. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I went to, uh, through school, I went through high school. I went to Enterprise High School, and it was uh, in Northern California. Mm -hmm. And it was a music high school. They have a uh, show choir. Mm -hmm. You guys know the show Glee? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was us, but in real life. Mm -hmm. It was the number one show choir in uh, California. Wow. Which part did you play? I played sax, I played in the band. No, that was a joke, I meant which oh, Glee well, well, part. Oh, well, the Glee part, uh, you know. You and I have never seen Glee. I don't know why I asked that question. <laughs> but it's a good show. Um, and I was always into music. And when I first was thinking about going to college, I actually wasn't thinking about majoring in music. I, I was into flying. My dad was a pilot. Mm. Uh, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a doctor. And one day my dad sat me down and he's like, do what you love to do. Because if not, you could end up 25 years down the road and so ask yourself what you're doing. So at that point in time, you grabbed a magazine and went in your room for about three years? Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. <laughs> um, and so I, I went to school now. And, and when I went to college, I wasn't even thinking about being an engineer. I thought I'd be an acoustical engineer, design cathedrals, is churches, right? studios. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, there is no acoustical engineer <laughs> degree. And the only way I could have done it. I didn't it, know that. Yeah. The, you have to make your own degree up. And there was no one at Chico State where I went that um, specialized in that. The only person in California was at Cal Poly. And I called him. He's like, I'll be your advisor, but you have to do all the work. And I was like, I don't know anything about this. Mm. 
And then um, I was like, well, okay, well, I'll be a music performance major. It's what my dad told me to do. That's what I'll do. So I started playing, and, uh, and then I was like, well, this is a great idea, but what am I going to do for a job when right. I'm done with this? Make a living. And I'd always been into music. I'd always been into recording. You know, all these bands and groups I were in always had sound. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine's like, well, they have a recording arts department. You should do that. So then that's how I got into it was I got a double major in music performance and music recording, and that's how I got into it. You had it pretty tough, as, as I recall. Your first client was uh, Dr. Dre. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was a tough way to start. Uh, you should try to start a little higher. You yeah, know? well, that's you know, <laughs> I was really trying to shoot for the Josh Groban. I, fixes, I, gotcha, but, you know, gotcha. I had to settle for Dr. Dre. Yeah, yeah. So I feel sorry. We're sorry for you. But. I know. Well, Drew went straight to the top. He started with Barney. With Barney, that's yeah. awesome. Sing the Barney yeah. song, Drew. It was, it was a special time in my life. <laughs> Keep it near and dear to my heart. To this day, he gets violently ill when he sees purple. Go ahead. Um, so you started with Dr. Dre. Well, I mean, I guess you can't say I started with Dr. Dre. My first session ever was for a Dr. Dre session. It was with uh, Mike Landon, Mailman, sure. for an artist of theirs named Liva. And I recorded vocals, and that was the very first time that I was in charge of a session. Wow. You know, I had worked with engineers that were like, record this for me, print this for me, mm -hmm. uh, the mixes are ready, do it, you know. Mm -hmm. But this was the first time where it was me deciding what was going to happen. And I worked with them for a few days, but that kind of kick-started the people are like, oh, you worked with him? Mm -hmm. We need you to track vocals. Right. And it kind of snowballed down from there. Wow. Wow. Jason, one of the things that, and one of the reasons I had you on, uh, asked you to be on the show was, um, you're equally comfortable in the analog world and the digital world, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to pretend for the purposes of this show that that you're an analog guy and I'm, I'm the digital bad guy, and we're going to kind of spar a little bit about okay. those two worlds, uh, if we can. I doubt if we can, but um, <laughs> um, wh why, why analog? What's wrong with doing mixes that don't sound analog? You know... I have a mastering engineer friend of, I, of mine, and we talk about this a lot. I feel that analog gives you a certain feeling in the music that your ears want to hear. Um, I'm a firm believer that if the same mixer, if you mixed a song in the box and you mix a song from two inch tape, people are going to pick your two inch tape mix over the in the box mix, hands down. I don't even think anybody would ever pick the digital mix. I, I disagree with that. Well. That's 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 why we're here. But I respect you. Yeah. You know, I, I just feel like it, it adds the warmth, the natural things that are happening physically mm -hmm. to the tape and to the sound as it's being processed, mm -hmm. uh, adds a particular harmonic to the music that I don't think you can capture in digital. Now that doesn't mean you can't make it sound good in digital, mm -hmm. but I think you know if I listen to K Earth and they're, they're playing something from the 60s or the 70s on, I mean, you can have that volume down all the way and you can just feel the pulse of the music going through. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like you get that when it's all digital. For the sake of argument, let's say you're right, which you're not, of course, but let's just say you're <laughs> right. What are some of the techniques that you use in the box? Because I know you work in the box. Yes. So either you're a hypocrite or you've got techniques that you can get that sense of analog that you enjoy. Yeah. To, to, to manifest itself inside the box. I, I know that this could be a two-hour question, yes. but philosophically, what's your approach to getting analog in the box? Well, when I mix in the box, I, I, my theory and the way I structure is exactly as though I were mixing on an SSL. Mm -hmm. I do my gain staging the same way. Mm -hmm. I do my levels the same way. Um, I'm never pounding a mix where the RMS is through the roof and you're turning in, uh, it's almost the same level as if it was mastered. Mm -hmm. I, I don't work like that. I work as though yeah, I'm on a console. I try to think of headroom the same way. Mm -hmm. And I really think part of the reason why people say, well, your mixes sound analog, is I spend a lot of time thinking about panning and using verb and delays in a way to place things in a mix to make them become mm -hmm. a little more depth and to kind of give you that feeling. Like, I'll use delays and reverb that you'll never hear. Even if you solo it, you probably won't hear it. But it just makes it go from flat to make it sound like it has a little roundness to it. Mm -hmm. And just to add just a little bit of grit in there. Because to me, that's what we're missing in the digital, is that grit. Mm -hmm. Now, you get to mix at the studio a lot on an mm -hmm. SSL. Mm -hmm. Now, even though you're technically in the box, you mm -hmm. have it spread out on the console. That's mm -hmm. adding kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. That And you're adding some analog energy back into what's happening. What I think's what I think is extremely critical in what you said is, is in the analog world, 
there is no zero VU or DB. It's 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 just like like my friend Ed C taught me the redder the better. It's <laughs> like Jason Manny, all my buddies, we just peg the meters. And I, I used to disregard the meters in the in the digital world. And one day I, I pulled pulled it all back, and my mix just went yep zero zero in that world. It's, you can't. And I think some of the some of the analogness that we like, and, and please disagree, is a function of of that we learn to manipulate the process. And, and when you when you manipulate digital the same way, it gets you the exact opposite result that you want sometimes. And, and, and so your statement about gain staging and, and headroom, that's so critical, isn't it? I mean, I try now to keep not just zero, but I try to stay around 3 dB under zero, and I've noticed my width is... I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I would have to say that's probably my biggest pet peeve, because we all know engineers that have been engineers that are great. And you listen to mixes that they're doing currently, and the first thing you hear is that level is pushed, mm -hmm. and it just makes your mix close up and come down, 100%. and like you, you lose the resonance of the bass, you lose the resonance of the kick drum, mm -hmm. the vocals are gonna fight you, and I mean you couldn't have hit it better. As you pull that level down, the physics of what's happening, like I mean I don't even think we fully understand digitally what's happening. We understand analog; it's been mm -hmm. around forever. You hit a tape, you know the magnets on the tape are moving. You're getting certain kinds of harmonic distortion. We know that's happening. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of us really understand what's no. happening as we're hitting it. And as you pointed out, you took a mix you did where mm -hmm. you were doing the analog thing, where you're, you're hitting it because you know you're going to hit analog hard to get the harmonic distortion. That's mm -hmm. where that resonance and that mm -hmm. warmth comes from. In digital, mm -hmm. you're right; it's the exact opposite. You hit it harder; it gets colder, smaller, and narrower. Mm -hmm. Are you a big proponent of like? Um, uh, Colin, Colin McDowell's, like DSP's, uh, the analog channel, or like some of the, like I love that. I also love uh, Crane Songs, Phoenix. Are you a proponent of those kind of, or Heat on, on, on in, the, in the Pro Tools DAW? Are, are, do, you, do you feel that they can approximate anything that you like about this wonderful analog world that you're like? I such haven't a gotten to use the Crane Song or the Heat. I have messed around with the McDSP. I'm not a fan of it. It sounds like a blanket has been placed over. I get what they're doing, and the feel when you first put it on, you're like, oh, I really like that. But as you, if you listen real quietly and you start bypassing, you start hearing it, it's less, it, it's just masking the sound. It's like throwing a blanket over it rather than trying to actually process the sound to make it I sound would, better. I would argue that. That's what analog does in general, so it should be a pretty close pro I mean, well, but warm, it does... warm is just another word for dull, so if you make it mm -hmm. duller, that should be analog, right, well, right we'll, Jason? We'll have to disagree on that. I definitely don't think warm is dull. It, it, you know, Herb, I'm teasing. Yeah. You know, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Jason, Jason knows I'm teasing, yes. but I just want you guys to kind of, if I don't play the bad guy, we won't get the information we want, and this cat knows this stuff, so. See, I don't think analog is a blanket on the sound. The analog, especially if we're going to talk tape, let's just say, when we say analog, let's just assume we're talking two inch so that we have a base. It's not a blanket, it's the process that's going down. You're not applying the analog to the kick drum, you are recording the kick drum to the analog. If you're hitting it harder, red is good. The harder you're hitting it, the more you're getting that second and third harmonic order distortion, which is where the resonance and the kick in your well, chest comes from. You're not from. really getting it, it's just, it's just Elevating it because it's it's bringing down the the, the first order stuff, yes. and so it's, it's accentuating it's, yeah, those things yeah. that make it but resonant. The effect is it becomes louder. And you know, and I just don't think a simple plug-in that has an analog button on it is going to be able to reproduce that. I mean, they, they, the, mm -hmm. the mathematical calculations that would be needed. I mean, the plug-in would be thirty terabytes for it to ooh, accurately ooh, do ooh. it. So 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 to be serious for a minute. Yeah. So 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 you don't think. You don't think that any of the analog emul emulation type plugins actually contribute anything? No, I don't think that. I think, like I said, I haven't used the Crane song, and I know a lot of people like it. I know uh, Dave that is the uh, guy, Dave Hill. yeah, Dave Hill that owns Genius. Crane song, smartest guy you're ever gonna I meet. Know. And and I haven't had the opportunity to use his mm -hmm. the, his plugins. Mm -hmm. I've heard good things. Yeah, I use them and I I, I love it. Yeah. I love it. If what I about, were, to, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I say if I were to try one. I would try one from someone like him mm -hmm. um, because I know that he's got the knowledge of the digital and the analog that if he's going to recreate it, he's going to do it as true 
and as authentic as possible, not cutting corners. Uh, just, just as a favor to me, go back and look at the uh, analog channel by MacDSP. Just spend a little time with I it because Colin, I know, worked extremely hard on that. And uh, I, think, I think it does have some usefulness. If, if you spend a little time with it, it's not a walk up to it and get your analog world right away. Right. But, but uh, a, a lot of guys we have on the show, that's their favorite plug-in. Have, have you had much experience with the tape emulators like the the Waves MPX or the UAD uh, ATR-102 and the Studio 800? Yeah, I'm actually sponsored by Universal Audio, so I have all of their plugins, and I, I love the one, ATR their 102. 102 is amazing. Andrew Whooper and I were, were, were talking about how it seems to somehow make the wick mix wider. I don't know. My, I got an ATR-102, yeah. and, and, and it doesn't even do that. I got to tell you, I know the guy that designed it, and uh, since we're going to be on this subject, I just did NAMM this year. Uh, I've been with them for three years, mm -hmm. and I do, you know, I'll do a mix and talk about it at NAMM. Mm -hmm. And this year I did a Mayor Hawthorne song, his single, The Walk. Mm -hmm. And the guy that, that is the lead designer there, his name is uh, Dave Berners. Smart and uh, and ugh, ridiculously smart guy, mm -hmm. and super nice. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. not. He's very. You can talk to him. You know what I mean? It's not weird. But he came up to me and he told me a story. And this is what kind of made me feel good. Like that the way I'm thinking about engineering and digital is working. Mm -hmm. He said that he had been listening to the radio and he heard the walk, and he really liked how analog it sounded. And he wondered if that was achievable in a digital environment. Two months later, they asked me to do NAM. I go to do NAM. I send in the song. He opens up the session and realizes it's the same song and that the analog was done with the plugins that he designed. Well, you just made that. my point for me. So, so I am right in all of this. You can you it, can a, a, it, emulate analog you in can, the digital world because you did it. You can emulate it, but I still don't think Come on, that man. it's as Give good. Give me credit. Give me credit. I won uh, that argument. You got the credit. I won that <laughs> argument. You won. You won. Vote on Facebook. <laughs> Uh, Herb and Will, I've, 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 I want to spend about half the time on this, and I want to spend half the time on another subject. Can you guys kind of keep me in check so I won't run out of time? Because I could talk to Jason all day. He's such a sweetheart. Um, sometimes I wonder, this isn't a question, it's more an observation. Sometimes I hear these records that try to be overly analog. Yeah, I call it like Girls Gone Wild, I call it Analog Gone Wild. It's right. just crazy, you know who I'm talking about. Yes. Golly, it's like, pick the best tools for, for, for the song, for the production. Don't use analog because um, the Beatles used it in the, in, the, in the 1920s or whatever. Pick whatever works best for a song. There's some songs that don't lend themselves to too much analog, and there's some songs, is that Beyonce? Yeah. Hey, there's some songs. B, we'll call you right back. Yeah, tell, tell I'm busy. Okay, cool. There's some Actually, songs. She's calling for you. Oh. <laughs> okay, Beyonce, thank okay. you. Okay. There's some songs that lend themselves to, to, to various amounts of analogness, and there's some songs that don't. You know, like, like I'm not quite so sure that EDM, that world, benefits from too much analog. I like analog synths in that world, right. but I don't like them recorded on tape. Uh, it, what, give me um, your take on like several, like, like say, let's, let's move like from country to rock to pop. Okay. Like, where, where does the analog world really work for you? Because I know you're multidimensional. You did Slaughterhouse. Yeah. I mean, I think analog is going to be benefit you in most situations. I actually agree with you in the electronic dance music that while I don't think it's as necessary, because we're not dealing with as many live instruments, mm -hmm. it's all coming from a software synth based thing, mm -hmm. that maybe the, the coolness of the sound of digital with the way they'd use filters and going back and forth, yeah, I don't know if you would benefit as much because you re that music is supposed to be in your face mm -hmm. and almost rude and grab you and so make you, you listen. So when you say in your face, analog makes it out of your face? No. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. He's out of control. He's, yeah, well, you know. Stay unwrapped yes. today. <laughs> no, um, I'm a big analog fan. I mean, I, I, I grew I, up in analog. But I think you pointed out a good thing. Analog is awesome if mm -hmm. you know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And when? Now, yeah, and, and I had the benefit of starting when it was still analog. Mm -hmm. I think my biggest pet peeve, I, I did the uh, Universal Audio interview, mm -hmm. and I specifically said in there, like, producers, mm -hmm. you need engineers, oh, not yeah. people that are fast in Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if you have... Even though that'd be a step up, too, right Yes. Now. <laughs> so even if you do a record and, you, and you're going to make it analog, if you're using an engineer that doesn't know 
what analog is or how it works, you you're going to have a, a mess on your hands. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah I agree. Um, let's, say, let's say a young cat coming along, 18 years old, doesn't have access to the, to the equipment we grew up using. Mm -hmm. and, and you know both worlds extremely well, and you're actually really competent in the digital world. <laughs> uh, what would your advice be as a shortcut for them to kind of, they don't have time like we did to spend all this time in the analog world. Do you have any advice in terms of a shortcut for them going from uh, what they know now into the analog world a little bit? Is it a is it a plug-in route or save up your money and maybe just get start with one piece of tube gear? What would be your advice for somebody at home, an average guy? Well, I think if you don't have access to work in a studio to be an assistant, you want to pick out some songs that you think sound good and find out who the engineers are that mixed them. And then, I mean, chances are you're going to be able to find out what gear that engineer uses. Look from, up the studio and then look up the studio's equipment see list. See what gear they the use. And, 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 you know, I mean, half the time, I mean, I don't know about you, but if someone randomly calls me or contacts me on Facebook and wants to talk about audio, I'm going to talk to them for three weeks. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, we love to talk about it. So, you know, I, people ask me, you know, like, oh, if you have a plug-in, how, how do you learn how to use it? Well, mm -hmm. all these plugins, especially nowadays, Waves, Universal Audio, whoever, they have engineers mm -hmm. like us make presets. So if someone likes the way Dave Pensado mixes, Go to the Waves plugin. You know from the ITL you just watched that he's using API 550 on a live drum and he's smacking a compressor to give it a little movement to make it beat sound live. Mm -hmm. Go in there and look and see what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Apply it to what you're doing. You know Learn. what I mean? So that way you're not in you're not just blindly stabbing, you know, right. like sometimes I'm sure you pulled open sessions that people have done rough mixes on and there's mm -hmm. 14 plugins on every single channel. Oh yeah. First of all, if you have 14 plugins on a channel, stop and turn them all off because it doesn't sound good and you're not, it's never going to sound good. Yeah. Less is more, learn what those pieces do, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and research, you know. Tell the story about the rough mix you were working on and and I think you were helping out a friend and, and they asked you, can you come help us? And the first thing you did was take all the plugins off and it sounded better. That happened. It was for a production group I work with a lot and they needed some uh, mixes done. And uh, they're like, well, we think we need to track some more drums. You know, they're, they're just, we can't hear the drums. And the engineer that had done it was working with a main, main name act, like definitely should have the skill level mm -hmm. to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I opened up the session, he had six plugins on the master fader, mm. right off the bat. Mm. And it literally, like I had no doubt, you couldn't hear the drums, you, the vocals were flat and two dimensional and they were loud and you could hear a couple of music parts and that like it sounded was, awful. Was it Drew? It wasn't Drew. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first thing I did was just bypass every single plugin on the master fader. As soon as I did that, the drums were there. By the way, guys, Drew's an incredible mixer. I just tease him because. Oh, go on, go on. Yeah, you're good. You see that barcode on Drew's shirt? Mm -hmm. Can you get a picture of Drew's He's shirt? A, a, uh, I, I've got this program in my iPhone. I scanned it, and it's for tampons. It's true. <laughs> All facts. Okay, well, that's a great segue to battery box. <laughs> oh, I, I, I used we'll to. Come back to it. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. We're running right, right out of time. Okay, back. Well, good question. Right, we're going to come back okay. to it. So you, you let's want to see how we're ready for batter's box? Yep. You ready? Sure. Hey guys, Jason has agreed to do a little different batter's box for us today, in that we're 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 we're, we're saying he's like the we're making him the the evil analog bad guy. What we're going to do today is we're going to he's going to give us his analog and his plug-in equivalent for these various things. Okay, let's start with EQs. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. <Woo> <laughs> <laughs> EQs. EQs. Lead vocals. EQs, lead vocals, uh, Neve or SSL? Both plug in and, and, and analog. Oh, I forgot where they are. See there, I already messed it up at the beginning. Uh, vocals, um, EQ, I would say GML or uh, an Avalon uh, 2055 uh, for a piece of gear. And then for a plug in? For a plug in, um, I would like the uh, Universal Audio 88RS or their SSL uh, E uh, channel. Okay. Uh, acoustic guitars. Acoustic guitar. Mm, depends on how well it was recorded, but I would like a... One Drew recorded. One Drew recorded, so it was recorded well. I would say some kind of a Neve EQ, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, analog and even digital, I would probably keep it uh, either a, a Neve or like a Trident. 
Mm. Oh, the Triton A range. Yep. Uh, rap lead vocal. Rap lead vocal EQ. I mean, a lot of times I'll usually do it just on the SSL. Mm. Okay. You know, and if I got to go out, a GML. And then let's switch to compressors. Okay. Uh, kicks. Uh, I love the 160 VU gear and plug-in. Oh yeah, the, the, yeah. the UAD was pretty deep. Yeah. Okay, snare drums. Uh, snare drum, uh, gear-wise, I love 2254, the Neve 2254A. Cool. Yeah. And plug-in? Plug-in, I would probably go with the 160 or maybe an LA-2A. And stereo bus? Stereo bus, um, on a console, I don't use stereo bus compression. In, 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 in the plug-in, I use the uh, UA Precision Limiter. I gotta work with that because I'm I'm a L2 diehard. See, I, I'm not a fan of the L2. I love it, uh, <laughs> but I know how to use it. Um, oh, whoa, 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 whoa! whoa. <laughs> um, reverbs. Reverb, analog. I'm gonna say a couple of them. I would like a, a 140 plate, a 250 digital reverb, or I really like the Lexicon 224, which you can put on the Lark off of 480. Okay. And then uh, the two twenty four from UAD. No, uh, we're just talking gear wise. Okay. Uh, uh, plug in wise, I like the UAD plate one forty. Mm -hmm. I, I like the True Verb, the Waves True Verb. Oh, they got gosh. a couple That's settings so in underrated. there. I love. Yeah. I agree. But the, but the UAD two twenty four, I love the two twenty four is my first digital reverb. Yeah. So I like. I that. I love the two twenty four, and and UA's emulation is is pretty accurate. Delays. Delays uh, on the console. I mean, I don't think anything beats a PCM 42 or a DMX. I just don't think anything can beat that. Cool. And then, and then you're, you're. Um, I like the UA Cooper's Time Cube, and I like the Sound Toys Echo Boy. Wow. Have you tried the Massey delay? I haven't. It's great too. Uh, okay, I'm gonna stretch for this one, but be kind. Mm -hmm. uh, tape machines. Tape machines. I have always been a fan of the Studer half inch. I, I love it. To print too? Yeah, the A20, it's it's one of my favorites. I love the ATR, but Studer's always treated me well. And in the plug-in world? Plug-in, ATR 102 every day. Okay. That's pretty good, wasn't it, Herb? Very good, very good. And by well the way, done. guys, I, I, I'm, I have a long, comfortable relationship with Jason. I'm teasing him about all this stuff. He's, he's, he's been kind enough to play along. We kind of prearranged some of the me being the bad guy thing. So <laughs> Jason's not, if, if you're on my side, don't flame Jason because it's just, it's, 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 it's a way that, to get you some pretty, pretty valuable information and make it in, interesting. Have I got time now to do a... Get a, a couple in and then we're going to uh, Drew or Corner Office. You got time Okay. For yeah, this isn't going to be that long, but I thought this was incredibly important because Jason has some, some very good insight into how being a musician can enhance um, the process of mixing. And I asked Jason if he would think about if you haven't if you didn't have the, the luxury of learning and, and having formal training as being a musician, is there a shortcut or a way that you can get some of the same information? First of all, how do you feel that being a musician amplifies the mixing process in terms of quality? Well, I think being a musician is going to help you out because you understand the mechanics of what makes a song have groove and, and how the parts need to blend together so that what you as a band are trying to achieve is what the audience is going to hear. Mm -hmm. And you're going to understand how the little inside things, inside rhythms, subtle things, help enhance mm -hmm. the listener and pull them in. And I think that really helps you when you're mixing to be able to think like, well, when I'm mixing a song, I'm thinking of myself on the other side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, Absolutely. what do I want people to hear and how do I want them to envision what I'm hearing? And mm -hmm. I think being the fact that I came as a live musician mm -hmm. gives me that insight to be like, I know this works. I know this doesn't work because I did a gig where that doesn't I work. I agree because I started out live too. All of might argue did, but um, in terms of a, an 18 year old, that's a great career path. In terms of somebody in their mid 20s, is there is there a substitute? We talked a little bit about this before yeah. the show. Is there a substitute? Um, uh, I'm real proud of Drew because Drew is, has an, a, an insatiable thirst for knowledge, and Drew's. Uh, teaching himself, Drew knows music already, but he's kind of uh, uh, implementing some of that with, with with studying some things. Is that is that a route? What's what's the best route to kind of catch up if you if you're already engineering and you want to add that as another skill set? Well, I think if you're, we had talked about going to live shows, 
Bruce and, Wadeen, yeah. Yeah, you know, go to a live show and not and don't go to just a live show of music that you're comfortable with right. listening. Like if you like rock, don't go to a rock show. Right. You've already been to rock shows. Get outside mm -hmm. your own box. Yeah, go to a jazz show. Mm -hmm. Go to a go to an orchestra. Absolutely. I mean, you. I mean, Pick some of the best recordings never, ever done. Absolutely. Or are orchestral. I mean, orchestral mm -hmm. engineers are amazing. You know, like immerse yourself. And when you're listening to the music, don't be there as a student. Don't be there as a fan. Like, think about why people are here watching this music. What about what's happening on the stage? Like, mm -hmm. if you're watching a pop song, if you're watching, like, you're hearing elements come at you. What, what are those elements that are drawing you in? I mean, mm -hmm. you can see people nodding their heads. Mm -hmm. If there's a particularly good keyboard player who has a really good groove or a bass player, you'll see people responding to that. I mean, you can take that to when you're mixing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great point. I can't remember if we discussed this, but were, were you the guy in your groups that, that paid attention to the PA and the sound and all that? I mean, I did a little bit. We had dedicated people that did that. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, I can't say that I was that person that was dedicated to it. I was definitely the, the, the band geek, not the yeah. audio geek. Because I feel like the live experience for me prepared me a little better for engineering also, just, just being a live sound engineer. And, uh, Herb and I are working on a, a show a, a, about the live engineering world, several shows as a matter of fact, because we both feel that that's incredibly important for your development and an alternative way to use your engineering <coughs> skills. Uh, one final thought on, on, the, on the music thing. It, it's important when you're communicating with musicians and producers to and, and the guy says, uh, can you take it from Jump Street? If you go, what, huh, what did you say? It's kind of good to know some of the lingo within the musical worlds, and it gives a little confidence to the people you're directing and telling what to do, or that you're being directed and told what to do by. Yep. When you go, okay, I'll go to the top, and we'll start from the top. Uh, I think that's also another benefit of being in, in the live world and playing <coughs> world, musicians' world. Yeah, I definitely think people are more comfortable when they know that you play an instrument. Mm -hmm. They come at it ease, especially when you're recording. Um, I've gotten a few gigs simply because I read music, and mm -hmm. a lot of engineers don't. Also, too, I think a skill set that, that, that our audience needs to really understand is when you and I first started, no one ever asked us if something was in tune or not or to tune vocals. Yes. If you don't have the ability to hear pitch and, and that can come you can improve that with practice a lot of people think you, you're born with it or you just don't have it but that's not true you can get that skill and and that if, if it comes down to hiring an engineer that doesn't have that skill or does the guy that can that has a little bit of a reputation for yes for, for having pitch um, Ariel Shobaz the, the the friend of mine who was my assistant who did all the Nicki Minaj records and has a new record coming out Ariel started out as a classical musician he's got perfect pitch and so that was his inroad into the engineering world initially was by being the guy that could help you tune vocals and stuff like that. <clears throat> now, now look where he's at. Um, got to uh, go to our wow. corner office. I'm ready. Have some time. Let's Drew, do. what you got over there? Got some good questions here. Uh, first one from Day Williams, philosophical question. Uh, he says, my brain was getting fried at the end of today's mix session. So many tracks and non-destructive mixed choices. In a world of more and more options, how do you manage to keep things simple and focus on the big picture? Man, we should do a show on that. That's a great question, right. Mr. Williams. I'll let you take it. No, I'm gonna let you take it. I gotta think about okay. that for a second. Um, Deep. What was his first name? Die or Day, D-A-I. I I'll just call him Mr. Williams. Um, Dr. Williams. It depends on what hat you're wearing. If you're an engineer, you just you, you have to make it work. You you work with a producer, and, and and I told a story of someone brought me 15 shaker parts. I muted 12 of them. He walked in and said, "Man, how'd you get those shakers to work? I worked and I never could get them to work." And I just said, "Well, that's what you pay me to do." But try to find the start. Start with say a kick, snare, the main rhythm instrument. Uh, one more instrument and just and try to construct the mix from the basic building blocks and then as you as you add more stuff trust your heart and your instincts as to whether it fits whether it's covering something or or use your musical sensibilities if you've implemented some of the suggestions from Jason you'll have a feel for what's working and what's not and just remember at the end of the day all we're selling is hooks and grooves so anything that clouds the hook, anything that clouds the group, then, then very politely present that to the producer if that's not yourself and say, look, this isn't, my, this isn't the way I'm hearing the mix, but I want to present you with an idea that you can approve and help me finish if you like it, and if not, then you just 
use all, all eight trillion tracks. I, I, I think that might work. What do you think, Jay? Is that kind um, of a I, I think that's really good advice. Uh, I mean, you definitely start with the building blocks, mm -hmm. build it up. If you have tons of shakers, mm -hmm. you know, I always listen to it, and not every part has to be heard mm -hmm. up. Sometimes it's a groove part, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So sometimes it might be there just for a feel. It might be just a thing that gives you a little hop into the next beat, but mm -hmm. I've I've done mixes where people are like, I didn't even know there was a guitar in this song. <laughs> I'm like, that's because I took all that other stuff out that was clouding it up. You know, yeah. I, I think the way you described it is the way you got to. You got to add it in, and when you find something you know isn't working, yeah. you have to figure out a way to tell the producer and artist, be like, I really like this part, yeah. but I think it takes yeah. away. And then another quick thing, if it's a little muddy, stop the analog stuff. It's probably muddying it up. <laughs> True. <laughs> all right, one more. Uh, <laughs> One more, a little more, you know, technically specific. From Shane Davis, uh, do you need, uh, do you need a hardware compressor for rap vocals, or can it be done in the box? And if yes, I'm gonna build me it. 1176. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, guys. Uh, well, does he take. mean for recording or for mixing? I'm, I'm assuming for mixing. For mixing, no. You don't have to have an analog piece of gear. You can use a plug-in to do it. I think if you're recording, yeah. I think it's good to have it in there because then you're adding some character and a little noise and a little vibe to the vocal before you put it into Pro Tools. Because remember, Pro Tools takes a perfect picture of whatever you give it. So if you give it a vocal that doesn't have any cool aspects to it, that's what you're going to get out of it. Another one, Drew. Cool. Uh, from JXXX, uh, how does Jason feel about sonic, sonic varnish? How does he go about applying harmonic distortion to get that tape-like sound? Kind of cover that with sonic stuff. varnish. I like that with term. That tape. J Triple X is. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna get him start naming some segments, Herb. That was up <laughs> in your league with the uh, quality of in inventiveness. You know, I gotta tell you, I don't even think about that when I'm mixing. Yeah, I agree. I don't even think about that. I think about how the song can come together as a whole, and the tools that I'm using add those things in. A company like Universal Audio, if I'm putting 1176 on, I'm putting it on because I'm thinking of the hardware piece, and 1176 is known for second and third harmonic distortion, bringing it out. That's what makes the mm -hmm. bass vibrate and make your toes tickle. Mm -hmm. I don't think about it when I mix it. I'm thinking about what would sound good on this. Well, you know what? I think an 1176 mm -hmm. on a whole tech would sound and good. And that's experience, yeah. which mm -hmm. is no substitute for. Mm -hmm. Good question, J Triple X. Cool, cool. Yeah, Adam right. Drew, you got any more? Oh, yeah, I got one more. Um, from Algin Rios, or Reese Soak. Although I love, before you say it, I love Kessler Audio's comment where he said, I, I mix in the box because lugging a two inch upstairs is too heavy. <laughs> 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 I saw it earlier and I just couldn't, I was couldn't ask a question. I just froze because I wasn't starting Who's that from? It, from Kessler Audio, I think. Oh, it was, good, it was good, earlier good, this show. He's been cracking jokes all day. Uh, anyways, uh, go, go ahead. Uh, from, all right, so Algin Resock for Jason, do you recommend working with a manager to help grow your career? Well, you know, it's funny that you asked me that because <laughs> yeah, we just da Dave and I and Herb, where we were just talking about that. Yeah. Um, yes, a manager helps you. I've I've had three managers. My current manager, Andrew DiDio, is, I think, the person that I'm going to need. Managers don't get you work. I can't emphasize that enough for you. Well put. If you think you're going to get a manager and all of a sudden you're going to be working every day, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. A manager gets your name on a list that you can't get it on and helps represent you better. I am the worst negotiator. Me too. Me too. I, I, it's not that I don't value myself. I just want to work. I don't want to argue about money. Mm -hmm. I don't want to argue about deadlines. I want you to right. give it to me, mm -hmm. and I want to mix it, and I want us to be creative. And when we start talking money, I will let people dumb me down so much money and I'll do it and my friends will be looking at me like what is your problem I'm like oh, I just wanted to mix it mm -hmm. you know and you can't do that because you are bringing experience and you are bringing things in and having a manager pulls you that but a manager was not going to get you work a manager is going to help facilitate you getting in the door and helping you with the relationships you already have and a really good manager is going to have phone lists and going to have people to contact in that are you know calling it's the same as me I'm going to call 10 ANRs I'm going to be like hey it's Jason now you've heard my name, you'll remember when you need the mix. Instead, I have Andrew calling and saying, I have a Grammy Award winning engineer. He's worked on blah, 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 blah. He can bring this to you, this to you, this to you. I'm never going to say that because I just feel odd talking to about myself like that. Right. So, yeah. yeah, have a manager. Guys, um, we have the benefit of having one of the wisest men I know in the world sitting to my left. Jason. You're right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you and 
I, 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 I would be remiss if I didn't turn the entire show over to Herb to kind of finish that, 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 that answer, because Herb is one, a great manager. He's, he's, he's managed some top acts, and Herb has an opinion that, that I think we should spend a couple of minutes, I don't care where we are time-wise, and just listen to Herb, what his thoughts are. Um, Jason summed it up in really interesting and concise ways. Couple of things I would say, which, you, which both you guys know. Um, it's not unlike dating. The, the, the girl who's the finest and comes with the best reputation might not be the chemical fit for you. So you've got to find that fit. And that fit is partially chemical and par par partially strategic. Certain managers do, like in the artist business, some managers are great at touring, some managers are great at negotiating, some managers are great at publishing. Not every manager is great at everything. So you have to find what you need, but you have to know what you need to find what you have to have. So some of it is incumbent upon you. Have you have to have something to manage first. Well, there's, there's that too. Um, secondly, a little known fact that in some states it's against the law for managers to get you work. It's the way most artists get out of their agreements because it's against, in California it's against the law for managers to get you work. Agents have to get you work. So there's something, so, so again, a good manager should be letting you know all that because you might not know all that. And then you sit down and you craft a game plan. So all I would say to wrap it up is strategy is critical. <laughs> uh, <laughs> chem That's what I do to him all the time. Chemistry, chemistry is critical. And for those guys out there who are doing it, um, it's knowing at what point in your career that you think you may need that. There is a point where you don't need it. Then there's a point where it becomes critical. So when, when a person's first starting out, like 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 say uh, Alex Need or, or or Bill Kamick, one uh, at those levels, do they need a manager? At what level should you start thinking management? Well, I think, I think when you have something to manage, obviously. I think there's a. I think it's not that quite that simple. Mm -hmm. I think you have to know the person's aptitude. So somebody likes taking care of business, or they're organized, or they have relationships, or they network, or they so on and so forth. They may have some of the building blocks to go on and create a business for themselves, so that when they do pick a manager, they can actually work on more favorable terms on their behalf. Some, like Jason said, or like you are, may not want anything to do with it, but may have just innate engineering skills. That means a different kind of manager needs to come in. So it's not as simple as, Click. There's you. You need to talk to somebody who has some expertise, so they can sort of give you an evaluation of where you are, mm -hmm. and then that. So, so that step is probably the most important step for our audience. Who do you know that can give you some advice? I get a lot of that information in terms of from the show and so and so forth. Mm -hmm. Who people who want that kind of advice? So, mm -hmm. the game has changed. What you're managing has changed. What your goals are have changed. It's not all about now major mixes. As we expand mm -hmm. the show. We're going to places that you guys can now go and mobile and gaming and TV and all kinds of stuff that are, are, bound, are places that you wouldn't necessarily think about. So you also need to train yourself to be good for more as mm -hmm. well, too. So there's a lot to it. Knowing um, what you know about management, mm -hmm. if you were starting out as an engineer right now, mm -hmm. where would you go to look for a manager? I mean, if I was starting out, yeah, I well, would. I mean, do you go to the internet? Do you go to like the management.com or? Well, is there is there a, um, one of the things that I think has not changed about our business that that Jason kind of alluded to earlier was the same information that you can find about the songs that you like and what the engineer used to do on those songs. You can find the process of boiling down who the managers are, who are productive, what their offshoots are. They're now not just based in L.A. and New York and Nashville; they're all over the places. The internet can connect you, and part of this game is research. You researched when you came up, you researched when you came up, and we continue to have to. I, I kind of think that if you're a new engineer, let's say an assistant getting ready to become an engineer, I think the manager's less important and it's more the relationships you make with engineers. I've made relationships with you, I've made relationships with the guys that I assisted, and mm -hmm. I did a good job, so when Great I job. went independent, you yeah, know, they would they would say, here, here's a tracking gig. You know, you came up to me the first time I was working on things you were mixing. You're like, I really like the way you track those vocals. They sound good. You saying that in a room of people goes, oh, okay, well, Dave just mm -hmm. said this guy can record good vocals. Mm -hmm. I think when you're coming up, the relationships you have with the people, with engineers that you work with, is where mm -hmm. you're going to get your work, where you're going to meet managers. To build on your point and then to wrap it up is, relationships are critical in our game, yeah. period. In life. Start them, absolutely. Start them now, learn that art. 
they'll take you all the way through. And by the way, guys at this level have to continue to use those relationships to get through hurdles that they experience at this level. So start now. You don't need to know anybody to start to learn how to get relationships. So. Got a, got, a, got a question real quick from John Nilsby. To <laughs> up. John, quick, he wants to we know, Jason, is there any plugin at all that you prefer over its analog counterpart? Ooh, kind great question, John. Yeah. Is there any plugin that I like over its analog counterpart? No. <laughs> but I do love my digital plugins, but I, I, I would choose the piece of gear any day if I had the choice. Thank you for coming, And Dave sir. will disagree with me. No, I'm going to let you win this <laughs> one. You're, you're too popular. Thank, Thank you for Thank coming. You. Jay, thanks Thank for you, playing a good time. Thank I think you. you got some good information. You, you'll come back for us? Absolutely, anytime. Great, great. I had a great time. Is, we, this is wonderful. It, the, the hour flew by. Um, we're out of time. Why don't you wrap up and uh, get okay, out Okay, nothing to really wrap up. I Actually, think. I, I got a really quick one. Oh, yeah, you want to do Just very quickly. Um, Inspiration and passion, when you guys say are important about what you do, being inspired, being passionate about your space. So just a quick shout out to a guy who is a titan, but always has just been a regular guy. I've had the pleasure of getting to know him a little bit. Uh, Magic Johnson was one of, the, one of the groups of people who bought the Dodgers. And I ran into him probably a month ago, and you would have thought he was, he's just the kindest, coolest, most regular guy who is just moving the needle in big ways. So, you know, take, take inspiration and passion, and, and, and that's an example of somebody who, by the way, has a big footprint in entertainment, just got awarded a television network, is in movies, is in publishing, in stuff. People don't know necessarily about all that. Uh, he's one of us. Absolutely. And, and take that example and move it forward in your career. Uh, just to amplify that, I, I mixed uh, Avant for him back when he had his own label. He could be the only athlete that's ever had a successful label. Um, he's the only athlete that's done a lot of successful things. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. An inspiration so, on so many levels. No question about it. So congrats. Well, guys, thanks for sharing that with us, Herb. Um, once again, let me emphasize, before you send nasty letters, um, Jason knows I love him and respect him. I just, I just wanted you to get some information here, both sides of the coin in an entertaining way. Uh, ruminate on some of the stuff. <laughs> ruminate. Herb's giving, I had me, to do it. Herb's giving me this signal. I had to do and, it. I and, had to do and, it. And Herb's over there giving me this signal. Because I'm getting them on the monitor. And, um, but guys, I hope you learned something. Rewind the show. There's a lot of information there. It's not an either or world. It's it's whatever card you need to play that's in the deck at the time. And we got some great shows planned for you. We got surprises. Thanks for hanging with us. We'll see you on Facebook. Hasta mañana. <laughs>